Okay, so before I get into the main subject matter here that I want to discuss, um, I just want to do something that I don't usually do, which is a call out to use an Americanism for one of my subscribers, Declan Marsh. Um, so Declan, thanks for your message. Um, I appreciate all your support, mate. And that's really, it's nice to hear that sort of feedback. Um, yeah, so for those who don't know, Declan just sent me an inbox message to Facebook, just supporting the channel, just uh, um, giving me positive feedback, and I appreciate that. Um, some of you may know that I do have a page on Facebook, which is sort of for this channel. It was never really my intention to link my Facebook account and my YouTube channel. It was never really a thing because I, I get, I always get a lot of views on this channel. Well, not a lot compared to some, but I mean, most of the people who watch this channel, I'm not friends with. So that's why I was a little wary of connecting it to my Facebook thing and also for security reasons. But if anyone does send me a, an inbox message, um, my name's Nathan Hislip, if you don't know. Um, and if you happen to find me on Facebook and you send me an inbox there, I'll try my best to respond. So Declan, thank you for your support. Um, okay, uh, to get on to the issue that I want to discuss here. Um, I, I want to discuss the rise of the far right in this country and the ideology around blood and soil nationalism, because I really um, I have no time for it. Um, so a few days ago, Majid Nawaz, the um, LBC presenter and uh, anti-extremism activist, among other things, uh, suffered a racist attack in London. Um, he was beaten by, I believe it was two white men um, who hurled racist abuse at him and um, he suffered a, a cut on his head um, and some other lacerations, I think. Um, it was bad, of course it could have been worse, but that's bad enough. Um, just as a, an obvious statement for any sane person, Nobody should be subjected to a violent assault or verbal abuse simply because of the way they look. Whether that be the colour of their skin, whether that be the way they dress, anything. Anything, period. Uh, and I, I am universal in that. That includes people wearing the hijab, includes people wearing the burqa, it includes um, white people, black people, regardless. Nobody should be subjected to abuse, and especially not violent assault for the way they look. Um, I could talk about all sorts of extremes, and we are dealing with a lot of extremes in this country right now, but I'm going to focus on the far right because I have already made numerous videos about the problem of pan-Islamism, and no one can accuse me of being politically correct. No one can accuse me of shying around those issues. I've been, um, I think, very outspoken in my criticism of the way the regressive left um, approach Islamism. That is to say, whenever it is brought up, they immediately shout Islamophobia and so on. I think that is a very serious problem. And in terms of the threat level, I do think it's a bigger problem than far right groups. Um, in terms of the actual threat of, for example, terrorist attacks. For example, of the five major terrorist attacks in 2017, four were Islamist in nature and one was neo-nationalist slash far right. Um, so in terms of scale, I think the Islamist threat is far bigger. I also believe we face other major existential threats. Uh, the Russian state is a very big one, and to a lesser extent, the Chinese state. Um, I would say there are three biggest external threats, pan-Islamism, the Russian government, and to a lesser extent, the Chinese government. Um, but there are other threats out there. Domestically, um, I do think there's been a rise in racist attitudes in this country. And I, I'm not someone that 
goals for identity politics. I'm not someone who believes in race baiting or anything like that. But I do believe that the, where there are problems, they have to be discussed. And I think I want to kind of make a semi disclaimer here. Um, because I've made videos where I've been pretty vocal about my views on the regressive left and pan Islamism, I suspect there are some people that have come to my channel thinking that I am something that I'm not. So let me just be very clear here. If you're a member of the EDL, if you are a member of Combat 18 or any other sort of neo-Nazi group, I don't want you. I obviously can't control if you watch my videos or, videos or not, but don't make the mistake that because I'm outspoken about pan-Islamism, that means I'm okay with blood and soil nationalism. I'm not. I'm absolutely not. And I do not want that sort of support. Obviously, it's beyond my control if people watch the videos or not, but um, what I'm saying is don't come to this channel and think that I'm going to endorse any sort of far-right ideology, because I never will, ever. You know, I have um, friends from all backgrounds. I My former girlfriend is Chinese. Um, I have Muslim friends, so... I think we need controls on immigration. I think we need to be very assertive in terms of countering um, the divisiveness of identity politics and an array of other things. And I think pan-Islamism is toxic. But I think that there is a real problem with the rise in the far right. Now, partly this is the fault of the regressive left because they have galvanized far-right ideology by ignoring issues that should have been addressed. For example, predominantly Pakistani grooming gangs um, and pan-Islamist terror, because they simply will not, to give an example, Jeremy Corbyn is very outspoken about his condemnation of racism, except anti-Semitism, of course, but um, he's very outspoken you know, against far right groups. But when it comes, you know, this is a man who will not say Islamism by name. When those terrorist atrocities occurred in 2017, of course, Corbyn condemned it, but it was very generic condemnations. Um, I'm just using Corbyn as an example. There's many other examples of regressive left thinking. Um, but I think they've galvanized the far right because there are a lot of people turning to these groups because they're saying we are under attack and no one is doing anything about it. They believe that too much of Westminster is establishment, that there are too many people in power who are politically correct and who will not call a spade a spade. And I think that's why people like Boris Johnson also get traction. Now, critics of Boris Johnson will say, oh, you're playing the far right's playbook. But I would counter argue that and say, well, surely it's better that a mainstream politician, even a colorful one like Johnson, um, reclaims the argument and reclaims the fight from uh, white supremacists and neo-Nazi groups. Um, so I, I really get frustrated with the attitude that the regressive left take on this because they don't realise that their, their totalitarian attitude of labelling everything racist, um, all it does is anger people and divide people and ultimately will push some people towards this sort of ideology. Um, why do I have a problem with the far right? Well, let's first define what far right is. Um, I think it is very clear, you know, people say the term is thrown around and sometimes it is. But if you are talking blood and soil nationalism, if you are pushing a Lemonos narrative, like I saw a comment on one of my videos, I think it was on the Shamina Begum case, Enoch Powell warned us about these people. Um, in the 50s and the 60s. Now, what does these people mean? Does that mean Islamists? Well, it obviously doesn't because Islamism wasn't a thing when Enoch Powell was around. Um, so the, the statement was clearly a reference to minorities in general. And I have a big problem with that. It's racist, plain racist. Um, it's true that the term, the concept of racism is thrown around a lot, but 
if you are if you're hostile to people because of where they're from or because of the color of the skin and solely for those reasons then you're a racist by definition and those of us who dislike political correctness and identity politics shouldn't ignore the fact that racism is a problem it exists and there are white racists out there of course there's black racists and asian racists and i've been very clear that i don't like the double standards we often see and that you know i've condemned racists like sarah john who's asian american but as a white man i'm not going to be silent about white racists you know and the dikes of the edl on the surface they say they're just fighting islamic extremism but this is an organization with very real um football hooligan backgrounds you know there are a bunch of thugs and going down a main street um acting like a bunch of rowdy hooligans shouting engaland at the top of your lungs is not going to endear you to wider public support they'll say it's just uh it's just a kind of morale thing whatever that means but that's intimidating behavior i mean it's at best it's loutish behavior um so these groups cannot complain about bad pr when they act like a bunch of drunk hooligans um as for tommy robinson well i don't think that robinson is a hardcore white supremacist but he has a very checkered past and i think a lot of the supporters are so blinded by this uh, like the, there's this kind of robin hood image around tommy robinson like oh brave brave tommy versus the establishment and tommy just tells it like it is and all the rest of it not really um he's a very checkered past i mean tommy robinson is not even his real name so i think it's perfectly possible to speak out against islamism and the issues that he latches onto without necessarily supporting i mean there was a famous fallout between um for those who follow these things between majid nawaz and tommy robinson if you look at that whole situation it was robinson's whole attitude i think that caused that because he he's not diplomatic he barges into rooms and just shouts over people um his whole approach is misguided at best and it's not that everything he says is wrong uh, there is a problem with grooming gangs there is a problem with a lot of the things he talks about but i don't have time for the way he goes about it uh, i think it's polarizing and i think it's counterproductive um and tommy robinson's by no means the worst he just happens to be the most famous but um when i'm talking about blood and soil nationalism this isn't just opinions there is real world consequences when that young migrant guy was attacked in croydon i think it was two or three years ago that was disgusting we're talking about uh i think the young guy was 15 years old attacked by a mob of 15 people something like 15 20 people i mean it rightly provoked a lot of outrage um i think by the way just for the record i think gangs in general are the scum of the earth you know if you can't fight one-on-one -on -one, you're not a man the only time that might be acceptable is in wrestling kayfabe but you know in the real world any gang that attacks an individual and it isn't the first time i've heard of um two polish men suffered an attack like that uh somewhere in east anglia um and there's been a lot of incidents like this you know i'm not suggesting they're happening to a point that's kind of pandemic levels but it's any time it happens is one time too many it's evil i mean that sort of vicious racist attack and it absolutely is racist because racist slurs are used you know we're not talking about um opportunistic muggings this is specifically racist attacks and it should be called what it is so there is a problem with racism in this country whether brexit has escalated that or not is a controversial question um of course i don't think we could say brexit equals more racist attacks but without question there is nationalism around the brexit thing there is and i do think that blood and soil nationals use it as an excuse 
Now, the, these people will get really uptight about that and they'll say, oh, we're not all racist. Well, very few people are saying that you are racist, so don't be so sensitive. You know, um, I think the Leave side need to stop being such snowflakes, quite frankly. And always thinking, oh, you know, this knee jerk reaction, I'm not racist. Well, I know, of course, 17 million people aren't racists. And the very few Remainers that claim that are not speaking for the whole Remain side. You know, and I didn't want to bring Brexit into this, but, you know, inevitably it's going to come into everything. But let me just say this. Um, this sort of mentality, I mean, I hate racism across the board and I'm consistent. I condemn all racism, whether it be black supremacy, Asian supremacy, white supremacy. But I do, I do feel a responsibility as a white guy to acknowledge that white racism exists. And I'm not talking about the sort of um, the nonsense that you hear from Hollywood, like uh, Oscar's so white. That's that's not racism. What I'm talking about is vicious gang attacks um, on migrants, on on ethnic minority people. And yeah, it works both ways. I get that, but. You know, these these people are saying that they're just taking on Islamism. Um, that will be today. You know, 20 years ago, it would have been against the Jews. 30 years ago, against the blacks, etc. They dig beneath the surface, and these people are just fundamentally bigots. Um, and I have no time for their thinking. Um, I want this to be an open and tolerant country. That doesn't mean... Uh, being a pushover, it doesn't mean we don't have a controlled system, but I would hate to see a situation where Britain gets this image as as a racist country. I don't think we are, um, and we're certainly a lot less racist than some other countries. I would say parts of Asia are far more racist, but the point I would make is I think it's perfectly compatible to call pan-Islamism what it is and to call out problems like black-on-black -black crime in London, um, Pakistani grooming gangs, etc., whilst also recognising the dangers of blood and soil nationalism like a lemonous mentality or lazy generalisations, saying they're all like this, they're all like that. So when people come out with statements, and I'd also add another aspect to this which is very significant, Russia. It's very striking how many um, on the far right have an admiration for Putin's Russia. And it's pretty rich for them to talk about treason and talk about being sellouts to the British nation and all the rest of it when they're actively pandering to Putin's Russia. And it's an interesting thing that both the far right and the far left have that in common. They both seem to have this admiration for Putin's Russia, and they both go out of their way to defend it because of this warped notion that, oh, well, Russia takes on Islamism, so Russia's the only country protecting the white race. It, it's a sick way of thinking. Russia's a gangster state run by a dictator, and we should not be looking at it in any way to emulate. Um, so that's another big issue I take with these far-right groups. They're traitors. They actively support and promote and downplay a hostile foreign state. So um, I'll leave it there, but blood and soil nationalism is something that I uh, find very disturbing. I have no time for it. Um, and when you see the undercurrents of anti-Semitism, of white supremacist thinking and a whole range of other really really f real forms of bigotry then you just dig a little bit beneath the surface you see what it's really about i still don't think it's the biggest threat to this country but that doesn't mean there isn't a threat there there has been far-right attacks in western europe over the last 20 years uh just to go through a few of them um there was the soho nail bombing 1999 there was the oslo attack 2011 um, there was the vicious attack on a Birmingham mosque where a neo-Nazi thug killed a man in his 80s. Um, there was 
also um, a whole range of incidents that hadn't got the attention that they frankly should have got. And of course, there was the assassination of Joe Cox. So there is, I don't think it's comparable on a level to the rate of pan-Islamist attacks, but that doesn't mean that it's not a threat. 